Jackie Bell. I can't tell you how proud and privileged I am to speak to the graduating class of the 2014 class of the Graduate Real Estate School. Uh, some of you have graduated with honors, cum laude. Some of maybe even magna cum laude. John, I graduated. Thank you, Lottie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it's so nice to have this ceremony in this great Hilton Hotel. Uh, I knew Conrad Hilton. And uh, <clears throat> in, in 50 years ago, uh, we named the Hotel College after Conrad Hilton, as well as this hotel. We named it after Conrad Hilton because he was a great writer, a famous writer. He wrote a big check. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to touch on two things. One is I'm going to talk about the early days of business in Houston. And then I'm going to give you a list of suggestions on how to Live your life. It won't be anything you haven't heard before, but I call them welcomes, rules of order. Okay. In, in the 1940s, I lived in Brownsville, Texas, and had just graduated from Brownsville Junior College. <clears throat> my father insisted that we go to the University of Houston, my brother and me. Uh, my brother was two years older than I. His name was Jack. He had just returned from World War II. Uh, I missed World War II by 30 days. I had my orders to report for the draft, and then Truman dropped two atom bombs on Japan, and the war ended in a week. So in 1946, we're on our way to the University of Houston in Houston, Texas. Now, nobody in Brownsville had ever heard of the University of Houston. My father wanted us to come to Houston because of the city of Houston. He felt like he would be the capital of the business world one day, and he was not wrong. The city had a half a million people in the metropolitan area. Now it has six and a half million people in metropolitan Houston. Houston is a great place to be. I'll never forget when my father dropped us off <clears throat> to go to the University of Houston in September of 46. It was in front of Army Surplus House Trailer number 67. It was in Trailer Village, which is what now is called the Melcher parking lot. <clears throat> and there were about 200 house trailers the bathroom was a block and a half away. So my father dropped us off and he said, boys, I have paid your first semester's tuition. I have <clears throat> paid your first month's rent on this house trailer, 10 bucks. And he said, and here's $50 each. And boys, whenever you need anything, I want you to call me up on the telephone. Whatever you need, just call me up, and I'll explain how you can get by without it. <laughs> <laughs> and Keith, that was the last time we heard from him financially for the rest of our lives. And nor did we expect to. We did just fine. I went to work selling advertising for the Daily Cougar, which in those days was a weekly. And uh, we did singing acts for, in nightclubs. 10 bucks a night. We did uh, singing commercials on TV in 1948 when we had one TV station and nobody had any TV sets. <laughs> it was a different world. But my father was right, Brandon, because within a few years of my graduation, I personally knew George R. Brown. I knew Oscar Holcomb. I knew Gus Werther. 
I knew Judge Jim Elkins, Jesse Jones. I knew all of the movers and shakers in Houston. And if you want to know how I met them, come up after lunch and I'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> but here's the thing. Now there are city civic centers like the George Brown Convention Center and, and Holcomb Boulevard and what I've named after these people. Ari Bob Smith was one of them. He'd be considered a billionaire today. Bob Smith was an oil man. He was the largest landowner in Harris County, the largest landowner. <clears throat> he owned land that is today called both sides of the West Loop. He owned land that is today is called both sides of the West Belt. I'll never forget in 1953 when he bought the last tract of the West Belt land. It was 500 acres that funded on Westheimer that connected to 5,000 acres he already owned going to the south. <clears throat> and I worked for him, and so we drove out to look at the land. We were in his Cadillac, which was a big deal at the time. So as we drove across the, along the frontage there on West Timer, it was way out, way, way out in the country. I said, uh, boss, you know, in the shame, here I am getting ready to go into real estate business, and all the good deals are gone. <laughs> and he pulled over to the side, and he said, you silly peckerwood, <laughs> if you want to know what a peckerwood is, talk to me after <laughs> He said, you said silly peckerwood, don't you realize that the real estate boom in Houston, Texas has only begun? He said, banks will lend money on real estate today. Three years ago, they wouldn't do that. The, the bank wouldn't dare make a loan on real estate. Too risky. But today, you can borrow money on real estate. He said, the boom in Houston has only begun. Of course, he was right. Uh, and uh, he owned uh, the land where the Astrodome is. Uh, he owned... Uh, uh, 7,000 acres in North Houston. Uh, he had great faith in love in the land. And I remember what he told me about real estate. He said, don't spend money on expensive surveys on where you should buy. It's simple. Buy on Westheimer. I don't care how far you have to go out. Buy on Westheimer and you can't go wrong. And he was right. Okay, back to uh, old age, man. <clears throat> you know, the University of Houston and I are still the same age. Uh, we're both 86 years old. And uh, <clears throat> the University of Houston, however, has never been more vigorous. Jim, it's never been more on the go or more cutting edge than it is today. I, on the other hand, <laughs> and moving more slowly. As I often said, uh, Chuck, if you hear me talking about happy hour, I'm talking about a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I was always told to respect my elders, and now I don't have any. <laughs> One great advantage, however, no peer pressure. <laughs> It's been 65 years since I graduated from the University of Houston, and I've been deeply involved for a long time. I was chairman of the Board of Regents, as John mentioned, and uh, <clears throat> one of my proudest moments, Brandon, of being chairman of the Board of Regents was browbeating John Walsh <coughs> into becoming director of the Graduate Real Estate Program. My proudest moment.
Thank you, John. I would like to now to go to some advice for graduates. First of all, don't ever act like a big shot. The world loves humility. Big shots make enemies. You don't need them. Number two, smooth people that can help you. I was a champion smoozer in my day. <laughs> but the time hadn't even been invented. <laughs> Be willing to approach important people and make your pitch. Your success is a team effort, and you need to get important people on your team. Next, never burn a bridge. The person who hates you today is likely to be a good friend and supporter five years from now. Never overreact. Never burn a bridge. Time heals almost everything. Give time, time. By the way, uh, time is a great healer, but it's a lousy beautician. <laughs> <laughs> Number four, never argue with a stranger. Road rage is stupid. <laughs> Save your arguments for people you love. Always yield. Always yield. One of the hardest things in the world is when you're surrounded by friends and peers and somebody challenges you and wants to fight or wants to do whatever. <clears throat> it takes great courage to walk away, but that's what you've got to do. Number five, don't let success go to your head. In a good economy, in the real estate business, everything works. Everything works. And you begin to feel like it's all because of you. <laughs> I've seen it many, many times, including in myself. In spite of what you think, you're not invincible. There are things over which you have absolutely no control. Principally, the economy. No control. Don't ever assume that, quote, things will work out, unquote. Sometimes they don't. In terms of cash, stay as liquid as you possibly can. When you are liquid and have cash, you are wise, you are handsome, and you sing well, too. <laughs> Number six, don't ever go against your gut instincts. And unless you agree with it, never follow the advice of an expert. <laughs> Lawyers, engineers, architects, they are very qualified in what they do. But if they say want you to do something that's against your gut instinct, don't do it. Number seven. Remember people's names. Simply take the trouble to do so. Anybody can remember a face. Anybody. A person's name is the sweetest sound in the world to him. Go to the trouble to remember people's names. Let me get back to the University of Houston for a minute. Uh, you know, now I'm not even a member of the Board of Regents. The governor uh, replaced me on the Board of Regents. I've gone from who's who to who's he. <laughs> <laughs> the governor replaced me with Welcome Jr. And you might think that that's great in a lot of ways, and I guess it is in some ways, but the point is, Welcome Jr. is my worst critic. 
He can be very negative. In fact, his blood type is B negative. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so old, John, they cancel my blood type. <laughs> Just the other day, uh, I asked Welcome Jr., uh, did you hear my last speech? And he paused and he said, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the worst was Roger Welder, who is a region from Victoria, Texas, asked Welcome, exactly how old is Welcome Sr.? So Welcome paused for a minute and he said, uh, let me put it this way. When Welcome Senior was a teenager, the Dead Sea was only sick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number eight, dress like you're important. If you want people to think you're important, you must dress as though you are. When I was a student at the University of Houston, I wore a necktie and long sleeve shirts. Why? Because people, students thought I was somebody. They thought I was an employee. I could go to the head of the line in the cafeteria. I could go to the behind the counter in the bookstore. People thought I was important because I dressed like I was important. Number 10, don't dwell on the setback. <clears throat> when you foul up, there's no time to sit around and suck your thumb. What you've got to do is think about the failure. Develop your plan for a solution and then forget about it. Don't dwell on a setback. Number 11, always show enthusiasm. People love to do business with people who are positive. To succeed, you must have pride and passion in what you do. And while you're at it, use the good silverware every day. Burn the candles. Live for today in terms of, of your lifestyle and so forth. Just don't spend too much money. <laughs> Next, be willing to do things that other people are unwilling to do. Leadership is achieved by helping people. It's not by telling people what to do. And when you help people, you will automatically become the leader. Next, look people in the eye. That's what successful people do. And lastly, the most important part of your happiness comes from your self-image. It matters not what your terrible circumstance might be. If your self-image is good, you can be happy. There was a book called A Day in the Life of Ivan Yovanovitch, written by Solzhenitsyn or somebody like that years ago. And it was a story of a prisoner in Siberia, 25 below zero, who had a good day and was happy because that particular day he built a concrete block wall and he felt like he did a good job. Happiness depends on your own self-image. So how do you keep that high? You do it, Jim, by always doing the right thing. I remember LBJ once told me, he said, welcome to my problem as president is not doing the right thing, it is knowing the right thing to do. But you're not president. 99 times out of 100, you know what is right, do it. Simple example, when you let somebody ahead of you on the freeway into your lane, you're being a big person. You'll feel better about yourself when you do it. So let the guy come in. <coughs> Always be the big person and keep yourself in the child. All right, that's the end of my list, and I'm going to conclude now. Uh, how many people here have ever heard of Dr. Red Duke? I bumped into Red the other day at the Rivers Country Club. <clears throat> Red is, is an old man, he's not as old as I, but he's almost as old as I. And he said, welcome, you know you're getting 
known when you tell your best friend that you're having an affair and he wants to know who's catering it. 